Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about asymptotes. We're going to start off with vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes and then oblique asymptotes. Let's get started. The first thing I want to discuss is how do you even write an asymptote? So let's say I just tell you the asymptote is 3. Alright, so what is that? Is that a vertical asymptote or is that a horizontal asymptote? So that brings us to our first point. That asymptotes are equations and not just numbers. So for example, I can write x equal to 3 if this 3 was a vertical asymptote, or I can write y equal to 3 if this 3 was a horizontal asymptote. So there's a difference. So now let's talk about vertical asymptotes, which is going to be our first type of asymptotes, which we're going to abbreviate to VA. So now, they exist wherever the numerator or the denominator of a rational function is 0. So the question here is, what do we care about when we're looking for vertical asymptotes? Do we care about the top or do we care about the bottom? So the answer is, we only really care about the bottom. So we care about the denominator of a rational function being 0. And why is that? See, whenever the denominator of a rational function is equal to 0, we see the whole function, I mean the whole fraction, is undefined. So, therefore, we only care about the denominator. And here's a little quick way to remember why. So, there's two things I like to talk about, is two scenarios. Whenever we have 0 over a number, or a number over 0, right? So whenever we have 0 over a number, that tells you on, so you're good to go, so it's just going to be 0. However, whenever we have a number over 0, that tells you no, so that means that it's going to be undefined. So whenever you have a question of, if what is what do we care about, think about on or no. So when it tells you no, the zero is in the bottom, and that's what we care about, the bottom not being zero. So just keep that there in mind. And actually, we're going to turn this little the zero here into a blue zero, so it just stands out in your memory. And now, here's a little breather. Whenever we think about polynomials, they do not have vertical asymptotes. So whenever you look at a polynomial and they ask you for vertical asymptote, you automatically say there is none. All right? So let's jump into an example real quick so we can apply this. So here we go. So whenever we have, find the vertical asymptote of y equal to 3x minus 5 over x minus 4. We don't care about the top. So all we care about is the denominator. So we're going to set the bottom equal to 0. So x minus 4 equal to 0. Then what we're going to do is we're going to solve for x, and then we're going to get x equal to 4. So then we say our vertical asymptote is x equal to 4. See, it's not just 4. It is x equal to 4 because our vertical asymptote is an equation. All right? So let's move on to our next example, example 2, where we're going to function, which is 5 over x squared plus 9. So once again, we don't care about the top, and all we care about is the bottom. So we set the bottom equal to 0, so let's do that. x squared plus 9 equal to 0. So now there's many different ways that you can solve this, right? So you can actually solve for, um, in a quadratic formula, to solve for x, you can try to factor it, or in this case, which is the way I'm going to choose, I'm just going to move over the 9, and I'm going to take a square root. So now to solve for x, I'm just going to do the square root of both sides, and then I see that I run into an issue. I have a square root, and just to bring up a quick reminder, it's going to be plus or minus the square root of negative 9. So just I want to bring up this whole plus or minus idea whenever we do the square root of an even power. It's always plus or minus. But in this case, we have a negative 9 under the radical. We have a negative number under the radical, so this does not count because it's not a real solution. So therefore, we can say that we have no vertical asymptotes. So the reason why I chose this example is that just because you have an x on the bottom doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have a vertical asymptote. There's cases such as these where you can have an x on the bottom and you can just not find a real solution where the bottom is equal to zero. So that's about it for vertical asymptotes and now we're going to move on to horizontal asymptotes. So there's three main types, th three main scenarios when we're going to have to deal with vertical with horizontal asymptotes, right? And all we care about when we're computing horizontal asymptotes is the highest exponent of the top and the highest exponent of the bottom. 
So we don't care about anything else. We don't care about the smaller exponents. We don't care about that. We just care about the highest exponent. So since we're going to deal with the first scenario first, when the top exponent is bigger, we're going to look for the highest exponent in the top of this fraction, right? So the highest exponent between 3, 2, and nothing is going to be x to the third. So x to the third is our highest exponent, and the highest exponent of the bottom is just x to the 1. So whenever the top exponent is greater, which is the case here, we have x to the third on the top and x just x to the one on the bottom, then we say that we have no horizontal asymptote. So pretty easy. We just have whenever the top is bigger than the bottom, boom. I just have no horizontal asymptote, and I'm free, and I'm good to go. So that is the first rule. The second rule is going to be when the bottom is bigger. So I'm just going to flip the fraction that I had in the first example. And I'm going to see that the bottom is going to be x to the 3, and the top is going to be x. So now this, the rules switch, right? So now we're going to have a very big bottom and a very small top. So since the bottom is going to be bigger, we're going to say that the asymptote in these cases is going to be y equal to 0. So let me explain why, right? So let's say you have a very, very, very big bottom. So the example that we can think about this is that we have a dollar. Let's say I have a dollar, and I want to eat. I can eat at a dollar menu right now let's say I have a dollar but I want to eat with me and my friend so now we have to split that dollar between two people so now we have less money so less to eat actually we have the same amount of money and let's say I have a dollar and I want to feed half of Africa so now I'm gonna be able to feed almost no one because I'm gonna have so little so I'm gonna break up that dollar into a lot of pieces right so since the bottom is keeps growing the denominator keeps growing we're gonna be breaking up the dollar so small is going to be such little sense that we're just going to call it zero because you're almost going to have no money. So many people are splitting it up. So it's the same idea. So you're going to have one. Since the bottom is getting bigger, you're dividing it by a bigger and bigger number. So your number is actually getting smaller. So that's why the number is so small, we're going to call it zero. So in simple terms, whenever the bottom is just bigger, we call it y equal to zero. So the third and last scenario is going to be when the exponents are the same. So in this case, you see that you have 2x, which is just 2 to the 1, and then you have 3x. So in this case, the exponents are the same. So all we care about is going to be, all we care about is the coefficients, right? And in this case, the coefficients are 2 over 3, right? Because it's going to be 2x over 3x, which just gives you 2 over 3. So the answer would just be 2 over 3 it'll be y equal to 2 or 3. So keep that in, memory, in mind, that whenever we have an asymptote, we always need to make it y equals or x equals. So that's the first part. However, I kind of lied to you because when the top is greater, there's a special case. And that's going to be our oblique asymptote, right? So an oblique asymptote is actually not its own asymptote. An oblique asymptote is a special type of horizontal asymptote, which the good thing is that it's whether you have an oblique or you have a horizontal asymptote. You can't have both because an oblique is actually a horizontal asymptote. So oblique asymptotes actually only occur when the degree of the top is greater than the denominator by exactly 1, 2, or 3 degrees. So in this case, it's going to be exactly only by 1, right? So example of that real quick, that would just be something like whenever you have on the top x to the third, and whenever you have on the bottom x squared, or whenever you have on the top x squared, and whenever you have on the bottom x. Right? So whenever you have something like this where the top is exactly bigger than the bottom by one, as an example where you can have an oblique asymptote, right? So that's when we have oblique asymptotes. Now how do we find these oblique asymptotes? Once we recognize that the top is bigger than the bottom, we need to perform an operation in order to get it, in order to get this equation of the oblique asymptote. And to find these asymptotes, we need to use, I'm about to say it, it's a very painful word, and it's going to bring back some serious bad memories, but it is long division, which is very boring. So let's get to it. So now we're going to jump into some examples of just horizontal asymptotes. But like I said, when I tell you a horizontal asymptote, I'm not telling you whether it's an oblique or not. It can actually be an oblique whenever the top exponent is bigger, but only when it's bigger by exactly one. All right? So I can just tell you to find a horizontal, and I can actually be telling you to find an oblique, but it needs to be, it's going to be hidden in there. 
So let's look at the first example, right? So we have 3x minus 5 over x minus 4. So now we have this, we're going to say, okay, let's look at the exponents. The, on the top, we have just 3x. On the bottom, we just have x. So this is an example when the exponents are the same. So like I said, whenever the exponents are the same, all we're going to care about is the, uh, the, um, the coefficients. So in this case, the coefficients are 3 on the top and 1 on the bottom. So the coefficients are 3 over 1. So the asymptote in this case is y equal to 3. So it's actually that simple to just find the answer. All we look at is, what exponent is bigger? OK, in this case, they're the same. OK, so we apply our rule. It's whenever the exponents are the same, we just look out for the coefficients. So here it is, just 3. All right. Now the next one is going to be example 4, in which we look at the equation x squared minus 3 over x minus 1. All right, so now we look. What is the exponent at the top? The biggest exponent at the top is x squared. The biggest exponent at the bottom is x. OK, so we're saying that the top exponent is bigger. OK, but we need to remember, whenever the top exponent is bigger, there is that one exception where we can throw in the oblique asymptote. So let's look out for it. If you, if you don't have the oblique asymptote, you're good because you don't have an asymptote. When the top is bigger, by more than one, you're good to go. But in this case, x squared and x to the 1 is exactly 1 greater than the top. So therefore, when it's exactly 1 greater, we come back down here, and then we have our oblique asymptote, which we need to do long division. So this is an example when the top is bigger by 1. So that leads us to have an oblique asymptote all right and that means by oblique asymptote I just mean long division all right so now I'm gonna remove myself from here in about a second so I can actually perform the long division so if you guys have forgotten this it's okay it's quite simple so this is how we do it we have the top right x squared over 3 I mean x squared minus 3 being divided by, let's kind of rewrite this, x squared minus 3 being divided by the bottom, which is x squared plus 1. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, what am I going to multiply? What am I going to multiply to x to get x squared? Hmm, okay. x times x is x squared. So I'm going to distribute now this x to both of them. So x times x is x squared and then x times 1 is just plus x. Now I'm going to apply my minus from from division where I have to subtract the top from the bottom. So now I'm going to distribute this minus in here. It's going to get a minus now. And now I'm going to distribute this minus in here. So it's going to go from a plus to a minus. So now I've applied this negative so let me just get rid of it. So now it is no coincidence that when you go from the top to the bottom, the x squared and the negative x squared are going to cancel. All right? That is supposed to happen. The first terms are supposed to cancel. The x squared and the negative x squared are supposed to cancel. If it doesn't cancel, that's something telling you you did it wrong. So now we're going to have to combine the terms here. So we have a, a negative x. We have a negative x left, and then we also have a negative 3. So now we ask ourselves, what am I going to multiply to negative x? Actually, no, no. I apologize. What am I going to multiply to x to get negative x? So how do I go from x to negative x? I multiply it by a negative 1. So once again, I'm going to distribute the negative 1 into x and negative 1. And to x and positive 1. So negative 1 times x is just negative x, right? And then negative 1 times positive 1 is going to be negative 1. So now I do the same procedure where I apply the parentheses outside. I have a negative. I'm going to distribute it to both in here and in here. So it becomes positive. And now negative times negative is positive again. I'm going to leave this negative outside because I already applied it. And then now I'm going to have 
negative x plus x, which are going to cancel. And like I said, there's no coincidence that's supposed to happen. And then I'm going to have negative 3 plus 1, which is going to give me minus 2. Right? Now, we're done. We're done dividing because the reason, when do we know when we're done with long division? And that is whenever the remainder that we have, right, has a smaller degree than what we have over here. All right? So the x, there's nothing that I can multiply to the x to get 2. Because I'm going to have to start going down in powers. And I'm not doing that. I'm trying to multiply up. So, so now we're done with our, with our division, and our negative 2 becomes a remainder. Now, what is the oblique absence of this case? I just performed this whole long division, but I don't know what I'm looking for. So all you care about in, in the when it comes to the oblique asymptote is this right here, the x minus 1. So therefore, our answer is going to be y equal to x minus 1. And that's going to be our oblique asymptote. But if you notice, whenever we, we, only have, we only really have two asymptotes. We have x equal to a number and y equal to a number. In this case, when we have an oblique asymptote, it's still y equals. We just have an equation in this case. All right, so that's about it for now between vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes and oblique asymptotes. However, there's some other trickier, trickier examples that we're also going to cover in the practice sets. So stick around for those, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.